happy. So um, good morning and welcome to this very special planning meeting on the 27th of July 2021 for Neath Port Albert Council. Uh, this meeting will be conducted via the Teams protocol. So please uh, mute your phone. Uh, have your microphone muted unless I call on you to speak. Do not use the chat function unless you are reporting some sort of uh, dropout with IT or technical issue. It is not there for comments on the debate. Um, right, so I would like to also welcome today, we have, uh, I'm not sure if they're all in yet, but we, we do have some uh, guests. We have um, local members um, who are obviously concerned about this, or have a bit wish to speak on the on the application we have um representatives from welsh government and uh, arab the agents we have the press so uh, a welcome to everybody who's um, come to find out what's happening on this application today so i've done the welcome um so um, tammy if you could take people through the roll call please Certainly, Chair. Thank you. OK, I'll start with uh, councillors on the committee. So there's yourself, Councillor Patterson, who is present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sean Percy. Present. Thank you. Councillor Dennis Keogh. Present. Thank you. Bridian Mason. Present, no, Tommy. Present. Thank you. Scott Bamsey. Present, Tommy. Thank you. Ros Davis. Presennol present. Diolch. Steve Hunt. I'm here, Tammy. Thank you. Arwen Woolcock. Present, Chair. Thank you. Suzanne Renkes. Present. Thank you. Councillor Chris Williams. No, not present. Uh, we've received apologies, Chair, from Councillor Mark Prothero. Okay. OK, um, uh, Councillor Annette Wingrave, the non-voting LDP member. Present, Tammy. Thank you. We also have local member, Councillor Dean Causey. Present, Tammy. Thank you. Uh, Planning Officer Steve Ball. Yes, present. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, highways officers, Justin Griffith. Present, Tammy. Thank you. Good morning, thank everyone. Thank you. Good morning. And Delith Thomas. Present. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Legal officers, Mike Shaw. Yes. Good, good morning. Thank you. Rebecca McGregor. Present. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And Gavin White. Present, Tammy. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tammy Davis, I'm the Democratic Services Officer. We also have representatives from ARAP. Uh, David Brown. Yeah, present Tammy. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And Emmeline Rainish. Yeah, present. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Thank you. Good morning. We have the applicants from Welsh Government. Uh, Arthur <coughs> Emmer. Uh, all just observing this morning. Get them out. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. And Simon Jones. Morning, everybody. I'm here. Good morning. Uh, Powys, representatives from Powys, the adjoining LPA. Peter Morris. They're, they're not on the call at the moment, Tammy. They, they're they're invited. They, they may come along later, but they're invited. Oh, OK. I won't read anyone else out, but yeah. Chair, I'll let you know if they join. Tammy. Um, if, if I can just say that there's also other colleagues of mine in terms of Simon Nevins from Environmental Health, John Griffiths, Rights Away, and Rebecca Sharp, I think, is here as well from Biodiversity. There we go. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we also have representing Wales Online, Hannah Neary. How can anyone I haven't called out uh, and who is participating in the meeting let me know if I've missed somebody? Is? No. Tammy, just to mention, it's Sean Barnes here, Powys County Council, Commons Registration and Public Rights of Way again observing today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Welcome. 
there we are chair the roll call is complete yeah thank you very much tammy um, and welcome to everybody that's um, showing an interest in this application today uh, but just before we proceed um, i would like to say that this is the most uh, the largest and the most exciting application that i have uh, been chairing since becoming chair of the planning committee and i would like to pay um special um thanks to uh, all the officers who have been involved in completing the reports before you today and in particular uh, Steve Ball. Um, I think by the end of our report um, you will have uh, been speaking for quite some time Steve and I know you've been working on this for months and months so my, uh, my sincere thanks for all the hard work and to all your team members as well from throughout the different departments and collaborating with Powys on this in order to bring this to, uh, to this committee today. So then <clears throat> on that basis I will go to um, Part two, uh, declarations of interest. Could I ask members if they have declarations of interest? Please raise your hand. I don't see any, Tammy, do you? No? Okay, there we are then. We'll proceed on that one then. Um, uh, three is request for site visits. We have had none. And um, I'll go then to the one item today that is before us, which is application P 2021-0327, Global Centre of Rail Excellence, and it's on the reports, pages 5 to 142. Also to be taken into consideration is the presentation that uh, Mr. Ball has circulated. Uh, if anybody hasn't had that, if they could please contact Tammy and let them know. But otherwise, I will assume you'll have all had the reports and read them and that uh, it's to be taken into consideration with the presentation. So that being said, Mr. Ball, could I please hand over to you to take the committee through the report? Of course, thank you, Chair. I've, I've shared the um, presentation. I assume that that you have that. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I mean, thank thank you, uh, Chair, for for your kind comments to say this has been a um, a, a project that's been involved for a, a number, you know, a number of years in many respects. Because you know, members will will know that the previous Earthworks application came forward almost exactly one year ago today. Fun enough. Um, and, and it is a, a combined effort in terms of a number of different officers and, as you say, the collaboration with, with officers from Paris as well. Um, what I'll do, I'll turn my camera off and then I'll, um, I'll take you through the uh, extensive report. I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's such a, a detailed report. It's 140 odd pages. Um, and what I'll try and do is I'll try and cover the, the main points. Um, I won't necessarily go into every single element of the application or every single issue or impact because otherwise we'll probably be here all day. Um, but realistically, I'll cover what I think are the, the salient points and obviously the best thing to do once you've heard then from the applicants and the agents after myself and also the local ward member will be to, to open up to questions. And, and I think yeah. it may be that we'll, we'll be able to tease into any more devil in the detail if, if there's specific issues that members wish to raise. That's fine, Mr. Bourne. Please don't apologise for the length of the <laughs> report. <laughs> um, I might apologise for the length of my presentation because you know me, I, I do go on a little bit, but I'll, I'll do my best not to do too much. Thank you. Right, so um, the application for you, as, as you can see on the screen, is for the development of glo a global centre of rail excellence. The application are the Welsh ministers um, and the, de the detailed description is uh, on the screen in front of you and within the report itself. Um, as, um, as I stated before, almost a year ago exactly today, members uh, on the committee will have re recalled um, the application coming forward, which is also a very lengthy report considering the, the complementary restoration earthworks. And what that did for those who, who don't recall or who weren't on the call um, was to create effectively the looped landform platforms, which created what was called a flexible and adaptable area of land for a variety of uses. But in essence, if if um, if it hadn't come forward, it could have been used for a number of different uses, but it effectively was creating the earthworks for this application for the Global Centre Rail Excellence, which we're all um, pleased to say is now before members for a decision today. 
The um, the application itself, as the report says, is cross boundary, as was the earthworks. An application, an identical application, has been made to to powers for the same report, and that's going to be taken to their committee um, on Thursday this week. So, whereas last time members of powers uh, approved their part first, this time it's your chance to get in two days before powers to to consider the application. But ultimately, to to get the consent, it needs consent from both um, local planning authorities. On the screen um, is the site location plan. The red line, the, the um, dark red line, is the application site as it, ex it extends into Neath Patalba, and the dotted line is the extent of the application site within Paris's administrative boundaries. The, the site itself will be familiar to the to majority of, your, of you all. Um, the, the, uh, aerial photo on the screen isn't from this application. This is from the Restoration Earthworks, but it's it's the aerial photo. It just explains again what was approved before, because it is pertinent that all the issues and impacts arising from that earlier development have already been considered and have already been granted plan permission. And as you can see, the the green shows the embankments created and the orange shows the cuttings created. And you'll see from the next slide magically that they correspond to the creation of the the two um, loops within the scheme. These, the site itself is 475 hectares, and as you'll see as well and be aware, it is part part of the, the Nant Helen um, application in terms of the, the mining area, area and the adjoining area. The mining is actually coming to, um, it's actually ceasing very shortly, and there's been ongoing progressive restoration, which will continue over the course of the next um, year or so, and no doubt then lead into the, the further earthworks program that will be required to facilitate the Global Centre of Rail Excellence itself. On the screen in front of you is, is the master plan, and I'll zoom in on a couple of um, the, the areas shortly. If you um, look at the report effectively on pages 11 through to 14, um, it's, I won't go into every every element of it, but if you um, effectively look at it, it is to create the global centre of rail excellence, and page 11 specifically talks about why this application has come forward, and it is to, to deliver what is a UK based modern and comprehensive rail testing facility and it's about capacity and capabilities for testing and rolling stock and infrastructure. It's uh, intended to act as a catalyst for the creation of a rail technology hub in Wales and provide flexible platform for re leading research and development activity and in providing opportunities with industry to support skills development and generally develop and test rail sector principal standards and specification to improve the UK's strengths. It is a very exciting development. It's something that that um, is unique or will be unique in Wales, um, but unique in the in the UK, and and the the clear benefits of it are uh, identified within the report, and I'll be um, going into later. And generally speaking, it has the potential to have a transformational impact on um, this part of the the valleys in terms of regenerating the post coal landscape and creating new socio economic socio economic opportunities. So page 11, the, the main the main things within the master plan, I've zoomed in on the, the area. You can see the two tracks that are created on the platforms that have been approved already. The first one is a 6.9 kilometre rolling stock test track. The, the, the idea of that obviously is to test rolling stock um, at speeds of up to 110 miles an hour. And then there's a smaller 4.5 kilometre high tonnage infrastructure test track, which effectively is the kidney shape in the middle. Um, there's also lots of ancillary development in terms of the overhead lines. Um, there's there's platform and associated station building being proposed. There's fencing, landscaping, lighting, access tracks and the like throughout the, the site to, to facilitate the development itself. The previous application for the earthworks was centred on the bit in front of you, but this application also includes the existing washery, build, uh, washery site, which again, most of you will be familiar with. That site will be closed um, and all the buildings demolished. And effectively, this master plan indicates in outline form, because this is an outline application, the, the nature and range of activity will be undertaken within the site. Um, and as you can see, includes lots of um, sidings for, for coal rolling stock. It includes um, maintenance shed, very large maintenance sheds, um, potential research and development centres, carriage wash buildings, etc. It is a, a significant scheme. The application, because it's an outline, um, as the next slide shows, has to detail parameters for the buildings, for every building going to be provided on site. And effectively, this, this scheme shows, and as the um, uh, 
building heights at the bottom shows effectively there's going to be a range of different buildings up to 20,000 square meters worth of rail related buildings at varying different heights but ultimately up to a maximum of 15 meters in height and and the intention for that site as you will see within the uh, the pictures within my report is that it will be well there'll be functional buildings there'll be modern buildings and ultimately it will be a um, effectively it will be a much higher quality of development on the washery which will relate to the the intention for this to be a a unique and very high quality um, global centre of rail excellence that would encourage um, innovation and encourage investment and further opportunity for use of the facility. In terms of the, the report itself, then on pages 22 to 35, um, there's lots and lots of policies are listed and, and I won't I won't go into all the different policies. Ultimately, there's a range of different policies, which, you know, a raft of government and rail specific strategies and policies. Um, and throughout those, you'll see that there's a, you know, rail is a key thread, both generally in terms of sustainability, but also de decarbonisation agenda. It also refers obviously to, to plan policy Wales and, and the need for economic prosperity and, and post COVID recovery, obviously, at the moment and generally the need to steer economic development to appropriate locations, contributing to national sustainable placemaking outcomes. Page 31, also members will have had training on this, but just to re-emphasize the point for such a large application, Future Wales, the national plan, now forms part of a development plan, um, and that does include a range of policies, generally supporting growth and supporting the rural economy, national connectivity and the like. Um, and beyond that, in terms of the, the, the local development plan, clearly there's a range of different policies set out in, in the, um, the report, generally about you know, supporting policies in terms of appropriate development in the countryside, reinvigorating the valleys, making sure that development has no unacceptable impacts. In terms of um, publicity for the application, just draw your attention to the fact that this has been extensively publicised, not only through all the, um, the statutory and non-statutory consultees in, in the process, as you'd expect, but it has um, pre-application consultation by the Welsh Government, both early stage and the statutory stage prior to the application, um, and also extensive representation or uh, publicity from both ourselves at MPT and also Powys. So we, for example, sent out around 660 odd letters to individual properties. We placed up site notices on two occasions. It's been in the press. So it has been extensively um, uh, publicized. Um, and generally speaking, what, what is interesting, I, I'll be honest, is we've only actually had, in addition to statutory consultees and, and local member response, we've only actually had five representations received, one in support and four objections, which is a surprise in some respect because I would have expected it to, to be more of more interest in raising questions locally. But I think it is important to note that there were some representations made um, at PAC stage, at the pre-application consultation stage, and that those have been addressed within the subsequent submissions. So I think generally speaking, the uh, a large part of the issues raised that have been addressed through the submissions, and generally speaking, we'll go into the, the, the principle and the, the impacts next. So in terms of the, the principle of development, um, I've talked about future Wales and very much in summary, the report concludes that um, while while this isn't in a national growth area as defined in, in future Wales, um, it is broadly in accordance with with the other and the remaining policies listed in the plan in terms of future Wales, in terms of encouraging um, growth and, and opportunity for economic development. And in terms of the local development plan, we uh, consider this to be, and it is an, an interesting, unique and, and exciting development. We um, consider it to be infrastructure that would be uh, um, acceptable in principle under policy SC1 of the LDP. Um, and in addition to that, it would also be supported by a range of different policies, including SB20 about developing the transport system, uh, the need for employment development under SP1, and as I said before, reinvigorating the valleys under SP6. So the principle of development is considered to be in accordance with both future Wales broadly and with, L and with the LDP planning policies. So therefore, what we then need to do is consider the impacts and then subsequent to that, consider if there are any residual impacts arising for the development, uh, we look at the planning balance at the end in terms of is are any of those impacts outweighed by the um, the benefits put forward on this development. So then moving next to issues of um, need and socioeconomic impacts, page 51 um, onwards deals with the wider socioeconomic opportunities. And I say I, I won't go into lots of detail, but it is 
interesting that we've been involved for a number of years um, in discussions with them um, with Welsh Government and partners because it is part of a joint venture with Paris and, and MPT and um, it has been a Welsh Government led supported by industry project but it is now moving through this application towards an industry led project supported by the government and it is there to, to address a number of specific rail industry issues but also offering the wider social economic opportunities that are listed on page 51 um, and generally speaking, it's what I said before in terms of the, the creation of a facility that has multifaceted benefits, generally in an area with high levels of deprivation and a facility that can breathe new life to um, an area of old mining community. Page 52 on table two um, is a really interesting table. I won't go through it in detail, but the, the table is provided within the environmental statement and it, it demonstrates on a raft of organisational benefits for local and national government, for end unit users and local organisations, for rail industry organisations. Um, and generally speaking, each and every one of those organisations would have significant benef benefits arising from this development. And I think that that's an interesting, if you haven't read it, it's worth reading through um, at, at, at some point um, as my presentation continues and as you, you hear from other, other speakers today. In, in terms of um, the decarbonisation agenda, it's also um, very notable to emphasise that, you know, research and development investments will be critical as part of this in, in terms of the, um, net, the need to achieve net zero economy of carbon economy by 2050 and taking up new te technologies and investing in rail infrastructure and rolling stock. This is critical to, to meeting those, those um, targets. So it, it creates that test bed for new green technology. And, and it's clearly demonstrating that the proposed GCRE will be in line with the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act as well in terms of creating those opportunities and the sustainable placemaking outcomes. In terms of benefits to uh, the, the economy, they are listed uh, on page 55, the, the actual economics of it. But the, the main thing really, there, there's a significant addition to gross value added uplift to the Welsh economy. And as members I'm sure will focus in on during construction and in terms of operation, there will be um, di both direct and indirect jobs created as a consequence of this facility, as well as the potential spin-off opportunities from creation of the um, effectively the, uh, uh, the the additional opportunities that arise as a result of having a global centre of excellence in the in the area. Those are listed um, on page 55. So if, if um, in phase one, which is listed earlier, if they develop just phase one, it could create up to 53 direct jobs, up to 163 in the event of the, the whole development progresses as we, we would hope it would do so. Um, and that's just in construction period. And during operation, those jobs will will, um, will go up to 100 between 141 and 298 direct and indirect jobs, um, as listed in the table at the top of page 56. So generally speaking, the, in terms of socioeconomic impacts, there are multifaceted benefits, as I say, that that clearly um, uh, are significant factors weighing in in the power and balance in terms of providing this facility in an area of relatively high levels of deprivation. Moving on next to the specific impacts, landscape and visual impact uh, address at page 57 to 64. Now, in terms of um, those, if I just pause briefly, I'll, I'll take you through the, there's a couple of drone videos, um, one of which you may have seen before, but other ones you, uh, which goes across the wash area won't. So if I can just show you those, if, if you, if there's any problems with these chair, please let me know. I will. Ho hopefully it will work just fine as before. So yeah, it's this, working. excellent. So th this video, um, takes you across the, the top of the, the wedding cake effect if you across the, the main site. And I might do, I might zoom slightly further forward. So it's going across. Now this was taken last year and this is the one that members would have seen when we dealt with the Earthworks application. So you can see all the, the ongoing work at the existing Dan Helen site. And it's cutting across and as you, you can see, you're just starting to see the washery in the top right hand corner, you've got the existing washery and you can start seeing the communities in the top right hand corner in Ontloin. Mm. So the, the rail would actually be coming coming around in, in this part here. So you've got the, the washery area in the top right hand corner and effectively in, in this area is where the, the rail, um, the tracks would be zooming around in that part of the, the, the site. 
and there you go a bit closer view then of the washery and the communities on the right hand side very useful mr ball thank you i would like to say i flew it myself but clearly i got someone else to do that <laughs> OK, and then and th this one is one that hasn't been seen and, and this is really useful. So th this shows just for memory reference. This is the uh, road coming down from Wembley Avenue from, from the road through to Oncline and Seven. And this in the bottom right hand corner is the access to the site, which will be used as the main access to the site. And this is the existing washery, obviously, with the existing rail line coming through. So you can see all, all the existing buildings on site will be removed. Obviously, all the coal will be removed and, and the site will be landscaped. It will be new building provided. It will be um, sustainable drainage will be created and, and provided within the site. And effectively, the, the site will become a, a significantly improved environment uh, befitting the, the nature of the active or the nature of the um, operations being proposed. The Intervalley Road you'll see on the top left hand corner that's the existing intervalley road which is the fast road obviously connecting the valleys and then you've got the existing access that comes into the washery at the top yep. and all of this area here is part of the site and you'll see that footpaths for example do cross the site and they come down through the site which will be affected by the development but there are separate regulatory processes addressing matters related to footways that will come subsequent to this application Okay, and then again, just in terms of context, members would have seen some of these photos. This this was taken last year again by by the drone footage. This just shows the photo looking across. So you've got the wedding cake and and the main part of the site, and you've got the existing um, as you can see the uh, national grid lines. And ultimately, you you'll recall that you've got the um, scheduled monument comes along here as well, which was affected by the earthworks as well, and which again has been assessed within the report later. And that's some of you from the other side. So you can start seeing the communities of, of Oncline and Seven on the, on the left hand side. And again, the, the track will be coming round around this way along between the between the wedding cake and the settlement. And then again, looking across from the other side from Paris's direction, looking across the site, you've got the washery in the top left hand corner, communities of Seven and Oncline. And this is just emphasizing what you've seen on the on the video. This is a good photo that shows the existing access and the, the extensive site. It is a very large washery site. It is previously developed land, as the report explains. And ultimately, it, this will be bringing life to to a site um, uh, once it uh, is no longer required for the, the coal washing purposes. And again, looking back from just above the Intervalley Road, so it's showing the relationship with the, the nearest properties. So in terms of landscape visual impact, the report gone into detail that there are a number of different viewpoints within the environmental statement of which certain ones are within Neath Patel. But um, generally speaking, the most important thing to remember is that the earthworks has already been approved. So therefore, a large part of the existing landscape change, the change to landscape character and visual impact has already occurred or will already occur as a consequence of the approval we've, we've given. Um, there will be uh, mitigation measures in terms of uh, landscape and planting and obviously with the existing cuttings that will uh, provide um, screening to parts of the track. And in that regard, in page 58 details effectively what the, the main impacts from this application are. And those are initially construction impacts over and above what we was approved for the earthworks, but then effectively laying the rail tracks and associated infrastructure, platforms, gantries, new sidings and the new development um, at the washer, etc. That that is what we're considering today. That's what the um, the report has gone into detail on. Generally speaking, it, they, there will be an introduction of obviously urbanising features into that um, earthworks landscape and additional built development in and around the washery building. The mitigation, which will be controlled both um, in terms of landscape strategies and face specific landscaping conditions, will reduce effects largely within the first five years. Um, there will be no residual landscape effects in Neath Patel but at, at year 15, which is the, the figure in terms of when the planting will become well established. But there will be some residual landscape effects um, from parts of Paris and parts of Brecon Beacons National Park that have been considered in the report and will be weighed in the planning balance at the end. 
and in terms of the the washery uh, i refer to the fact that it, it will be larger and and more development in that area but it's a very large site they will be modern buildings they'll be purpose build uh, built and it will be a high quality environment as a consequence all of which will be controlled through reserve matters and through the conditions and, and finally in terms of uh, landscape visual impacts the in terms of the impact on brecon beacons national park um there have been some concerns expressed by the uh, uh, National Park Authority, notably um, in respect of a bit of the, the residual landscape impacts, but also in respect of concerns about tranquility, particularly from the trig point, which is um, point number three on the plan in front of you. But ultimately, what uh, we're generally, generally satisfied with the degree of impacts that would be acceptable, but there are also concerns or matters be noted in respect of lighting strategies and there are some unknowns in that regard uh, that the applicants have acknowledged that the the actual final strategy hasn't been produced so there are conditions not only requiring a dark skies assessment because you'll know that British Brecon Beacons is um, a, a dark skies reserve but also a lighting strategy and schemes to to ensure that the uh, the nature of activities and lighting is controlled um, to an acceptable level. In terms of the uh, landscape, I won't go into these details because I think I can use these for, for questions, but there are, there are levels that show the relationship um, of, of the, the track to the nearby communities and the distances involved, which you'll see are, are quite reasonable distances, somewhere in the region of 470 to 500 odd plus metres. And, and the, the relationships are, are identified, obviously, in terms of showing in certain points that the, the track is within cuttings and certain points it's on top of the embankments. And again, for the sidings at the bottom, and I'll, I'll cover those responses to questions if needed. And generally speaking, the um, views in front of you are ones that you, you've seen similar before that identify, you know, the existing views in terms of the wedding cake and the views across from Montline Cemetery and from the San Helen Road, just emphasising that it is um, very visible in certain views. And obviously, obviously that demonstrates that the landscape change will will be um, impacted from the, the earthwork, but also from the introduction of the urbanising features. But the next one shows the existing view from the trig point, which is the top one is the existing view and the bottom one is a photo montage to create it to show effectively what it would be like at year 15 with the addition of planting. And you'll see that the track effectively from the power view is coming around the corner here and you've got the existing washery buildings in the, the bottom left hand corner here. So the existing washery buildings here and then the new uh, rail buildings in the washery here. And again, this is a, a slightly uh, additional view. Previously, you would have the same view without the trains. Now, effectively, it just demonstrates that you're going to have the trains. So you can just see the top of the trains going through. You've got additional planting coming in. And if you really zoom in, you can just see the the um, the, the gantries that you see that you see above the train tracks itself. Mm. Uh, so in terms of uh, landscape visual impact, as I say, the, the reports conclude that the impacts are generally acceptable, but the residual landscape impacts then will be weighed in the planning balance at the end. Then the next one that I come to is residential amenity. And yeah. I think the most important thing to address in that is this has been a subject of extensive discussions over many, many months with a range of different people um, to ensure that our environmental health officers in consultation with those within Paris have got all the necessary information to be confident in their assessment of impacts. And while we haven't had many representations received, that th those we have received are largely concerned about what the impact will be in terms of on their amenity, in terms of primarily in terms of noise, because this, this is a out of necessity, a 24 seven operation, even though it won't operate every night and, it, and will probably average more than like uh, two, two out of um, two night times out of seven and five evenings out of seven. It is a 24 seven necessity because of the operation requirements of a global centre of rail excellence. So we've needed to make sure that we are fully satisfied in those assessments, especially given the fact that there are still some unknowns about about this, because as a facility, it is um, it, there is not another another one around. So it will need to have the flexibility to to adapt, to be able to operate to its best um, ability to create the socioeconomic opportunities we've talked about. But generally speaking, um, they both during construction and operation, our environmental health officers in collaboration with Paris are satisfied that those impacts are acceptable. So firstly, in terms of construction, as I've said before, the earthworks have already been approved and a large part of the impacts from that, you know, there's a lot more earth shifting and, and um, noisy activities as a consequence of that, but those are controlled under that application and through a detailed construction environmental management plan. 
uh, including outer construction on that. Um, and we're satisfied that uh, any additional construction impacts can be controlled by condition. Um, and similarly, in terms of operation, the, um, the assessment itself, if I move to this one here, you'll, you'll see um, actually in my report at um, figure nine of the report, so on page 58, um, no, not page 58, sorry. I think 60, excuse me. The, the, the noise sensor receptors have been identified on a plan, figure nine on page 70. So if you look at page 70 report, there are a number of different um, uh, noise sensor receptors have been identified. Those are the ones that have been considered within the environmental statement and have been considered also within the, the plan that you have in front of you on the screen in terms of identifying the, the impacts um, following mitigation. So this, the one on the screen identifies there that you've got noise fences and barriers and mitigation provided by landscaping bund. So you'll see, for example, in our area, you've got the big thick purple line, which you'll see is a noise fence barrier of three meters height above above the rail. So effectively, it's showing rail barriers, uh, acoustic barriers going around the, the washery area. It also shows two meter height in certain elements above the actual track itself on the, the main track. And, and then you've also got um, mitigation provided by landscaping bunds. So with that mitigation in place, there have been predicted noise levels that have been generated as a consequence of looking at the worst case scenarios operation of the uh, the facility. And very much in summary, because it is a very detailed report, um, there are no objections raised from our environmental health officers, officers subject to what I'd call a suite of noise related conditions that have been the subject of extensive discussions between all parties. Um, and they include, and I, and I will list them for you, they include the construction environmental management plan, which is condition 11, the an operational noise management plan, which also includes a, a requirement for a 12, periodic 12 month review, and that's condition 41, and is a critical condition to control the operation of this to ensure the protection of amenity. Provision of acoustic barriers, condition 42, control and fixed plant, condition 43, and also particularly issues for compliance with noise limits, which is condition 44, including a requirement for them to actually survey post operation to demonstrate compliance with those le predicted levels. For ongoing monitoring scheme condition 45 and community li liaison scheme condition 46 is very important as well in terms of it isn't just about noise, it is about how this, uh, this facility will engage with the local community. Noise will be part of that, but that is considered to be important to ensure that any issues that do arise are dealt with within that forum, which would include uh, representatives from the local community. There's also other conditions related to noise limits that are really critical in condition 64, complaints mechanism and condition 65, and also limitations on activities at the washery, condition 61 and 62, primarily to control evening and nighttime operations to make sure that predicted impacts are, are satisfactory. Um, and all subject to, to though that suite of conditions, there are no unacceptable impacts arising from it in terms of noise or impact on residential amenity as a consequence. Um, and finally, in terms of environmental health and residential amenity issues, there, again, there's no issues or no adverse impact on air quality subject to the construction environmental management plan addressing all such matters. Okay. In terms of other matters, so highways, highway safety, very much in summary, the report in, indicates that there are no objections at the construction stage. Um, and, and indeed no objections at operational stage subject to a, a range of different conditions. Those include, for example, that the intervalley access, the existing access to the site I referred to that goes into the washery. Uh, which at the, at the top of the picture, as you, as you see it here, that, that that should only be used for heavy vehicles, construction emergencies, but not for staff. And therefore the staff access will be at the bottom. There'll also be a need for active travel improvements, particularly including on the junction coming down from, from the main route through Seven and Ontloin to have a combined cycle with footway and also bus uh, improvements in terms of the, um, the infrastructure at that junction. Also a need for things like post-operation surveys to, to demonstrate that the uh, predictions are acceptable and, and don't cause any unacceptable, uh, unknown um, effects and also conditions covering car parking, need for a travel plan related to sustainable transport, electric charging points um, and the like. 
um, and also issues to do with, you know, there's some concern, could this uh, generate people coming to see this facility because it's unique? It's quite possible. If so, there's a condition that would seek to monitor that. And if there, if it becomes an issue, then the condition will address that to make sure there's no adverse impacts arising on highway safety. Um, so generally speaking, there's no objection on highway safety. In terms of rights away, I mentioned earlier that there are rights away crossing the washery site. Um, there's no objection from our rights away officer or indeed from the Paris of, uh officer, um, but both identify that there's separate regulatory processes that need to be followed to, to, to cover any any impacts arising from, from the uh, impact on footway, foot, footpaths and bridleways. Um, finally, in terms of um, highway side of things, I just draw attention to page 82, and this is one of the, one of the matters that um, uh, Councillor Steve Hunt has, has raised and no doubt will we'll raise in discussions as well. There's been talk about and um, the impact in terms on rail and um, the the number of people of uh, vehicles using existing rail is, is not predicted to increase and therefore there's no additional impacts arising from this on for, for example rights away or um safe routes to communities further down the down the line and um, what councillor hunt um and and others in the area have, have talked about as a rail focused development you know there's clearly significant benefits but obviously it's about trying to make sure that those benefits arise for the upper Dulles Valley and one of the the desires quite clearly is to consider feasibility be reintroducing passenger rail um, on, on this line as part of or subsequent to this facility. What the report makes it quite clear is you know as a as a planner I think I, I would I would support that in terms of the the aspirations um, and I do strongly feel that that providing this facility, I always call it the field of dreams approach because the more likely chance of of the line opening up in a future. But what the report makes clear is this development does not justify and could not meet the legal test for requiring, for example, a feasibility study to be undertaken or indeed for any opening up of that that line. But ultimately what this will do quite clearly is give that line a new life where such life would no longer exist once the washery closed. So therefore this has the clear benefit of, of giving a great opportunity in the future should um, the Welsh Government and, and other partners, including ourselves as, as part of the joint venture, you know, seek to appropriately influence those discussions in, in the future that um, such feasibility may be able to considered. But it's not something we can control as part of this application. Other matters within the report, I'll probably uh, zoom through a bit more quicker. There's a lot more detail. So pages 83 to 92 cover matters related to biodiversity impacts. And um, these have been complex issues, particularly subject to much discussion because the complexity surrounding the earthworks approval going first and which has its own mitigation and then the global center rail excellence so therefore about how how they interact together so it has created complexity um but there's been generally a precautionary approach adopted and assessment of the impacts on protected species habitats protected spikes uh, sites etc within the report and very much in summary both the Neith Patel and power ecologists uh, in collaboration and uh, in discussion with NRW have, have raised no objections again subject to a suite of bio biodiversity conditions they include the the construction environmental management plan that I've referred to earlier but also other matters such as uh, in ecological protection plan uh, condition 13 strategic and phase specific biodiversity plans conditions 18 and 19 ecological management monitoring plan and condition 36 and, and all of those, the first plans will, will um, effectively tie in with the earthworks proposals. They'll more than likely be prepared together um, to, to demonstrate the assessment or the impact from the entirety of the project to control them. And there's also a range of other uh, conditions such as uh, controlling wildlife corridors, fencing, reptile, barn owls, landscape and lighting and biodiversity enhancement, and the latter required by um, planning policy well. So generally subject to the, that suite of extensive conditions there would be no unacceptable biodiversity impacts. It would comply with the, the local and plan policies and, as I say, create actually biodiversity enhancement as required by PPW. Other issues, heritage impact to address at pages 92 to 96. Um, generally speaking, the impact on the scheduled monument was considered under the Earthworks application in terms of the actual physical works. Um, scheduled monument consent is a separate regulatory process and an application has been made and is, is ongoing in terms of being considered by CADU, 
but CADU haven't raised any issues or unacceptable impacts arising on the scheduled monitoring or listed buildings within their responses. Um, and generally, we, we are satisfied that those, those, there will be no unacceptable impact on the setting of, of monuments or listed buildings. And similarly, that any archaeological impacts can be controlled by condition, which would be relating to a, a programme of works under a written scheme investigation. So again, subject to those conditions, there's no unacceptable impacts on, on heritage. Matters of drainage, very quickly dealt with page 97, effectively very much says this is the matter that would require sustainable um, drainage approval from, from the Saab Authority. Um, and if you had any questions on that, I'm sure Justin would emphasise that actually this, this has got potential beneficial impacts arising from this development in terms of the, the way in which surface water will be managed and controlled relating to the nearby watercourses. Similarly, in terms of geotechnical and land contamination issues, page 98 to 100, emphasise that there, there are no, no objections from the land contamination officer or indeed from the coal authority subject to conditions that would address matters to do with land contamination and, and mining legacy, i.e. making sure that that what is what is um, done there is safe and that anyone using using a facility subsequently will be protected um, subject to those conditions. Again, there's no objections in that process. Common land. Um, very similar to the rights of way side of things, it, it is a separate, albeit in this case, a very important regulatory process. I will actually, I wasn't going to put it on the presentation, but there is a slide that shows the extent of common land that's covered. So you can see a substantial area of the site is covered as common land, which is why it is such an uh, important process. But a common land strategy has been developed by the applicants in consultation with the, with the authorities and um, that regulatory process um, is is ongoing and, and will be ongoing over the next little while. The it has been led by the powers officer uh, who is actually present today. I, I am happy to say, you know, I, I I wouldn't know a lot about global common land regulatory process, but I know from being involved in many meetings with with her over the over the last couple of years that um, that, that it's in um, fine hands. And I have no doubt that in terms of those regulatory processes will be followed to the letter and will will be addressed subsequent to the grant of planning permission. Um, other issues. The report of page 101 um, deals with that matters of climate change mm -hmm. and obviously I emphasise that the project as a whole will play a, a clear role in the decarbonisation of the rail industry um, and generally on site, you know, through the adoption of, uh, of an on-site energy strategy and matters such as, you know, uh, charging points for ultra low emission vehicles and the like will very much comply with local and national climate change policy objectives. Um, in terms of Welsh language, page 103 to 105 this is not in in um, our uh, area it is, it is not a welsh language sensitive area but it is located effectively between uh Crinan, which is a sensitive area and paris which which has um welsh language policy so we we have considered that point and very much subject to conditions which require which condition 53 an overarching welsh language strategy and a condition 54 action plans to address um impacts predominantly in terms of making sure this addresses any potential uh, Welsh language issues, both generally speaking and in terms of the delivery of the project. We're more than satisfied that that will um, ensure that the project will contribute to the wellbeing goals of creating a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language. So again, that would be satisfaction in that regard. Finally, in terms of my presentation, you'll be pleased to know, and it's probably quicker than I thought I would be, um, at page 106 to 111 is a um, uh, the, the planning balance section. Now, the planning balance, as I said at the beginning, ultimately, even though the um, uh, report and my assessment has concluded that it is in accordance with planning policy, um, there are still um, residual impacts, notably in terms of residual landscape impacts um, on powers and on particularly on the Brecon Beacons National Park Authority. Um, but what the report concludes effectively is you know, there are wide ranging economic benefits that would re result and arise from this development. It, it will create a world class development of national importance. It will be unique um, in, in the UK and, and it has a clear potential to transform the Valley's communities with, with the kind of the next generation of high quality jobs and opportunities. Uh, I talked about the direct and indirect jobs proposed and, and particularly the application emphasise it is a potential catalyst for creation of a rail technology hub um, and all of, all of those things together are multifaceted in their in their benefits. Um, but in addition to that, it reuses the washery site, which is previously developed land, which which is um, clearly favoured by by policy um, and subject to controls on on its imp impacts that we've talked about will, will be 
more than acceptable in terms of providing um, additional employment benefits on that site as on its own. It's also an immediate response in, in I would call it post-COVID context, but I guess it's current moving hopefully to post-COVID context, and it is an immediate response. And generally speaking, it, it's very broadly summarising the, the report and it's, it's um, identifying the benefits, but all of those benefits are considered to outweigh the identified impacts from the, the from the report. So therefore, Chair, the, the recommendation within the report is that we should be granting plan permission subject to the extensive number, I think 60, 60 odd conditions within the report. Um, thank you, Chair. That's the end of my presentation. No, thank you, Mr. Ball. That was um, quite a long presentation, as I was expecting, but um, I have to compliment you on uh, covering the whole aspect. That doesn't mean to say that um, you've mentioned everything, but um, we will have questions. So if anybody has questions, um, obviously we'll get to that in, in due course. How I'm going to proceed at the moment is I'm going to, um, we have two speakers uh, that have registered today. So I'm going to be going to uh, the Welsh Government spokesman, Simon Jones. Um, and then I shall be going to our Arab agents, David Brown. Now, normally uh, we would restrict speakers to five minutes. However, I'm minded to use a little discretion here uh, because I do believe that anything that the speakers can uh, give to the committee will will be useful in their um, deliberations. So that being said, after those speakers, I will go to the local member whose interest uh, registered an interest to speak, uh, Councillor Dean Causey. And I understand that um, Councillor Hunt, who was mentioned in uh, Mr. Ball's report, he, of, he is a planning committee member and therefore will be able to speak at length um, as as a member of the planning committee, but I will come to you first, Councillor Hunt, and then I will open it up to the rest of the committee. So that's how I'm going to proceed now. Um, so I will call on the Welsh Government um, representative, uh, Simon Jones, please. And uh, welcome. Good, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for having me, uh, Councillor Patterson. And thank you to everybody for, for having me um, uh, and, and for convening this uh, this special uh, session. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it really is appreciated by uh, by, by ministers. And uh, thanks to Steve for the for the fantastic introduction. There's probably not a great deal more that I'm going to add, actually, that you won't have, that you won't have heard in 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 in, in, in Steve's presentation. But um, uh, this this is a really important project for for Welsh ministers. Uh, you you might have picked up that, that it's, it figures in the programme for government that was that was published only a few a few weeks ago. It's one of a, a relatively small number of infrastructure projects that are that are identified in the in the programme for government. Um, ministers are uh, focusing quite closely on this project. Are, are are genuinely interested in it for all the reasons that Steve set out. Um, this is a national. This is a project of national significance, uh, clearly with a with a with a local impact as well. But this is this is a, a nationally important project for 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 Wales, um, uh, and for for us, this is about economic development. Um, uh, it, it's um, you know that that is that is the prime reason that we're that we're that we're taking this forward. It happens to to align with some other interests of ours in in, in the rail sector, but actually this is about. This is about economic development. This is about creating something in Wales that uh, uh, industry across the UK and and further afield will want to come to Wales for to to be near, to invest in, to create jobs, to create opportunities for for people and 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 the place. So this is a this is a new approach that we're trying to trying to take to economic development about creating something that businesses want to be near. Rather than uh, the, uh, the 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 kind of uh, the alternative of trying to entice people to come here with financial in incentives, um, this was a project that we identified the need for three or four years ago through um, through the work that we were doing on, at the time on the Wales and Borders franchise, uh, and and concurrently with that we were talking to a number of. Uh, rolling stock manufacturers who are thinking about building factories in the UK. So uh, in the end of that process, CAF have built a factory in Newport. Um, but we also talked to, to a couple of other companies, Talgo and Siemens, who've, who've identified sites elsewhere in the UK. The common theme from all of those discussions was that there was a genuine need for testing facilities in the UK of a type which were not being offered at the moment. So all of those manufacturers 
uh, and all of the people that we were talking to in the bidding process were bemoaning the fact that they had to take rolling stock overseas to test properly. There are some limited facilities in the UK, um, but no one offers a, a, a testing oval, which is really important to allow uh, operators and uh, manufacturers and others to be able to prove the reliability of their of their rolling stock. And we've seen examples in the press over recent years of, of issues with that sort of thing. Um, but but nowhere, frankly, in the UK offers the opportunity to test infrastructure and develop new solutions for infrastructure. So um, we've we've got a signal in uh, across the railway network in the UK that needs to be replaced. There's a huge price tag of the tens of billions of pounds for replacing that. That, that clearly needs to be tested and uh, innovated upon to drive to drive cost out. Um, we see projects like Crossrail, East West Rail, uh, HS2, um, which are all going to be facing challenges around how you integrate new new rolling stock, new tracks, new signals, new power systems, new staff, new operating procedures, uh, the full gamut of, of of activities. How 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 can those things be be more efficiently tested to make sure that cost overruns, which we've seen a lot of in the press. Are become uh, be, become le uh, you know less lesser issues, and we've also seen with COVID the um, uh, the the number of passengers using the railway at the moment has massively has dramatically reduced. Um, there will be a need to be able to um, reduce the cost base of operating the railway, not just not just in the UK, but around the world. And innovation takes time and is really expensive in the railway industry. And we think there's a great position in here for, for the GCRE to be able to help the rail industry and its supply chain innovate new ways to be able to drive costs out in order to be able to respond to the kind of post-COVID uh, situation. And we've had a lot of engagement with the railway industry uh, about this, and I've indicated some of the things that we that we're interested in. Um, so signaling, infrastructure testing, storage, um, uh, maintenance, that integration testing. Those are all really important things for us to be able to do. Um, uh, Steve talked about the local uh, working that we've had, so we created a joint venture with the with the two local authorities, which has been incredibly useful for for us. Um, uh, the, our, our intention is to continue working very very closely with the local authorities uh, on, on this for the for the duration of the project. As Steve mentioned, we've had quite a bit of community engagement, uh, which we intend to to continue with. Um, uh, this isn't just a project uh, that's been uh, pursued by the Welsh government, though. We've uh, ministers have worked really hard to secure the involvement of the of the UK government um, in, in this. Um, uh, and it's especially important because the UK government are the, the major funders of the UK railway industry. So it's symbolically as well as practically important that they that they made a contribution. So we, ministers were really pleased when the Chancellor announced back in March of this year that the UK government was going to contribute £30 million to the scheme. That, that, that was the result of a lot of patient lobbying from uh, the previous group of ministers to, to try to, to make that happen. So we're really pleased that, that uh, that's come to place. Um, and soon after that, then Welsh ministers announced their own financial contribution of £50 million uh, to, to the project. That public funding will need to be substantially augmented by, by private sector investment. Um, but there are, as I've identified earlier on, quite a lot of private sector beneficiaries of this. So we so we are confident that there will be uh, uh, appetite in the market to in, to invest uh, in, in this. Um, and and yeah, this is a project which is going to cost several hundred million pounds to to uh, to develop the initial phases of. Um, but what we've seen from from facilities like this elsewhere in the world, they 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 develop and they grow over time as people identify new technologies which they need to be able to test and innovate on. There are you know there are additional things that need to be put in. So I don't know maybe maybe we'll need to put something in around hydrogen or something in future. So there are there are all sorts of different things that. Um, that that might happen in future um, uh, to to allow this thing to continue to develop and to continue to be invested in. Um, um, I mean, we're 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 keen that this project is is part of the the kind of economic aspirations of the 
the local authorities as well. So we're very keen to talk uh, with with partners about future growth deal bids and uh, leveling up uh, bids and all the rest of it. This is you know this isn't just a, a one off activity. We we see there being uh, lots of opportunities to to do different things in future. And as I said, this is about economic development. Um, so it's about creating local high quality jobs in the in the form that Steve uh, indicated. Um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, construction and operations, but even more importantly, frankly, is the opportunity to, to kind of create those those uh, those jobs uh, and opportunities in the supply chain, the people who are innovating with the railway industry, the kind of, to use the, the jargon, the kind of the value add that, that goes with that. Um, so people want to be near a facility like this. Uh, so you know, creating opportunities for homegrown innovation for for new small and medium sized enterprises to to be developed uh, and and importantly to work with our friends in the in the further and higher education sector so we've done quite a lot of work with the university so there are um, there are uh, there's there's already a well established research uh, uh, consortium if you like for the railway across uk universities uh, hitherto Welsh universities have, haven't been as active in that field, but we're doing quite a lot of work now with the Welsh universities to bring them to the table using the GCRE as the catalyst for that. So, so a huge amount of interest from industry, from academia, from government to take this project forward. Uh, so I think, you know, we've got, we have the wind in our sails. Um, this, uh, you know, if we're, if we're successful today, this is another major, this will be another major step forward. Uh, there will still be lots of other steps that we have to go through. This is a, is a, a, a big process for a, for a big project. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're really confident that we've, uh, that we've got the wind in ourselves. So thank you for your time and thank you for allowing me to speak. No problem at all, Mr uh, Jones. I'm very glad that you could come here and address our committee today. Um, I'm going to move on now then to David Brown uh, from Arup, the agents. Mr Brown. Thank you, Chair. Thank I you. I hope you can hear me OK. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak in favour of the application today. Um, I'll just run through a few uh, points on the planning merit from our perspective, from the applicant's perspective, following Simon's comments, if that's OK. Yes. Um, so as you just heard from Simon, the proposal offers an opportunity for Wales to host modern, comprehensive test facilities, uh, allowing the UK to grow its competitiveness in the rail sector. In addition, the wider drivers, as Steve has already mentioned, include uh, regeneration of the post coal landscape, creation of wide ranging socioeconomic opportunities, education skills and training opportunities within the local area and also enhancement to the local historic environment surrounding the site. The application follows a previous um, consent for the earthworks that Steve already mentioned and this application presents the next exciting step in the in the development of the GCRE and the future opportunity for the site. Uh, the proposal has been in development for um, many years um, and they've gone through extensive engagement both with local planning authorities, statutory consultees, the local community and industry experts. In September 2020, the application went through the pre-application consultation process uh, and responses from that process, as Steve mentioned, have shaped the application that you see before you today. In addition to that, a key, a key element of the engagement to date has been the regulatory meetings with the joint venture partners and they've really helped ensure the application has been refined and improved to maximise the benefits. And they've also allowed concerns to be raised, comprehensively discussed and addressed through the application. Uh, and we as applicants have seen real value in those meetings um, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's considered the post development um, would accord with national policy that Steve's already mentioned, and in particular would align with recently published Future Wales, which seeks to sustain and develop a vibrant national economy decarbonisation um, and support rural economies and communities. The proposal is broadly accord with local policy um, and there are wider material considerations that Steve summarised, um, which would result in a positive planning balance. The application submitted is accompanied by a, a thorough environmental statement and further information has also been submitted through an addendum recently, which again was consulted on um, and responses considered. The proposal includes appropriate mitigation measures uh, to reduce environmental impacts and prevent significant adverse effects, and that's both during construction and operation. And these measures would be secured by the, num the numerous conditions as proposed um, within the officer's report. 
I'd like to focus just briefly on a, on a couple of the key matters that were raised by members of the public uh, and in the officer's report. Uh, the first one of those being noise. Um, there's been extensive engagement with the environmental health officers uh, in both authorities, as, as Steve mentioned. Um, and that came in response to comments received at the pre-application stage, particularly around the 24 hour operation of the site mm -hmm. uh, and also the proximity of some of the adjoining um, properties, particularly in Ontloin and, and Severn, as um, Steve's mentioned. As per the plan that you've seen in the report, a number of noise barriers are proposed um, and these are these have been proposed in, in response to the surveys and the modelling done as part of the environmental assessment. And they'd seek to and the conditions that sit alongside those barriers would seek to control, manage and mitigate noise impacts as the projects move forward. With the mitigation and conditions proposed, the environmental health officers in both authorities concluded that the, the development would not lead to any unacceptable levels of noise and therefore have no objection to the development as proposed. In terms of the visual effects from the proposal, uh, the applicant acknowledges the landscape sensitivity of the site, um, particularly given its proximity to the Brecon Beacles National Park. As Steve mentioned, to reduce these potential landscape effects, a number of mitigation proposals have been incorporated into the design, including mitigation planting um, and also acoustic barriers, which also add to that landscape and visual uh, reduction through mitigation. So whilst there would be some landscape impacts arising from the proposed development, these will reduce once mitigation planting has established uh, with a, between five and 15 years, as Steve mentioned. And the report concludes the residual impact on the landscape needs to be considered within the overall planning balance um, and against all the other scheme considerations, such as the socioeconomic benefits outlined. On biodiversity and air quality, again, we've had proactive engagement with both Council Officers and Natural Resources Wales throughout the application process, and in particular following the pre-application consultation stage of the project. Following that stage, the biodiversity and air quality chapters were both updated uh, and additional information supplied through the addendum um, to respond to comments and also give greater confidence around mitigation and proposals, particularly in relation to the SSSI. Following that, the chapters recommend a number of mitigation measures to reduce impacts on habitats, protected species and notable species. And concerns previously raised by NRW in their consultation response uh, in relation to air quality impacts on the SSSI um, have been removed through the addendum and Natural Resources Wales confirmed they no longer hold those concerns on the application. As Steve outlined, with the numerous biodiversity conditions proposed through the officer report, Natural Resources Wales and the county ecologist have no objection to the application before you today. In summary, then, no objections have been raised by other statutory consultees uh, and appropriate conditions have been incorporated into the proposed um, report. And furthermore, as Steve mentioned, only four representations were made in objection to the application, which, as Steve mentioned, for a, a scheme of this size um, is, is a, a positive outcome, I would say, from an applicant's perspective. Um, so we've put forward a proposed development which has been found in consideration of the plan and balance to be acceptable by officers. In particular, the proposed development accords with advice in future Wales, planning policy Wales, and recent guidance on post COVID-19 recovery, building better places. The proposed development is supported by Welsh Government, the UK Government and the rail industry as a whole. And if the application gains your approval today, it will unlock an exciting next chapter for the site, the local communities that surround it and the local and national economy. I therefore ask you endorse the officer's report and its positive plan and balance in favour of consent in the scheme. Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. No, you're very welcome, Mr Brown, as was our other speaker. Um, I do think it adds uh, quality to the decision making to have people come to address um, the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Right, we've heard from uh, those two speakers now. Uh, before I open it up to uh, the committee, I'm going to go to the local member, uh, Councillor Dean Causey, who has uh, uh, intimated he wants to address committee. So, Councillor Dean Causey. Tammy, is he here? We'll just check. I'm not sure what's happened to Councillor Causey's connection. He's not here at the moment. Yeah, he's, he's left the meeting. Yeah, Democratic Services officers are contacting him as we speak. So if you'll just bear with us for one moment. 
if we can't get hold of him um, quickly, I'll I'll progress the meeting and then I'll come back to Councillor Corsi as and when he's able to join the meeting. OK, yeah. Yeah. So then on that basis, then um, we can't contact Councillor Corsi at the moment, but I will come back to him. I will um, go to Councillor Hunt, although he is a member of the planning committee. Um, he also wants to speak on this and then I'll go to uh, members of the committee. So Councillor Hunt, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm also a local member. Just for Yes. Yes. I beg your pardon. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I? Firstly, uh, thank you uh, again for your opening statements. Uh, can I firstly stress the importance that this morning's application in front of members today is given the necessary time so that all aspects of the lengthy report with Mr Ball's presentation of 142 pages is looked at properly, questions asked and statements given. The application is one of the biggest and most important we have received at Neath the Talbot Council for some time. And I understand it will also be going to Powys County Council Planning Committee very soon mm -hmm. uh, as a cross uh, boundary application. The, op the importance of proper scrutiny is paramount given the ramifications for everyone concerned across the UK, Wales, Powys and Neath the Talbot Council. But more importantly, for those residents living closest to the site, as this development will be here for decades to come if passed today uh, with us and with uh, the power and if passed by powers planning committee soon, as I stated. Can I firstly congratulate and thank our very own development manager, Mr. Steve Ball, for the presentation and the comprehensive and detailed report in front of us today. We need to recognise how much work Mr Ball and his small team of officers actually put into such a report as research policies and time consuming conversation meetings, etc. with applicants and officers to get to us where we are today. Also with powers, of course, it's a very challenging experience for them all. But in my time as a planning committee member, Mr Ball and his colleagues have never failed to deliver a first class report which deal with all the concerns that come with such an application. Chair, I will now address Mr Ball, officers, committee members with my views and questions, if that's OK, if that's OK with you, please. I appreciate my own questions and observations that form part of the document today. And within the report and, and Mr Ball's presentation might have been answered. Many of them, but I need to ask them again for further clarification within, within my own questions this morning. I have a few sections of the report to discuss, and hopefully I can pinpoint the pages to correspond to the best of my ability with the statements and quest questions. Maybe officers can write down my questions to them as I go along so they can respond when I finish. Yes, Councillor Hunt, I'm sure they'll do that for you. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, then, can I take you to page 36 of the report and ask the consultation with our own NPT internal consultees? There's a lot of information on that page that I fully endorse and support, but I suspect our residents and communities would need to see these initiatives actually delivered upon. For instance, the report doesn't explain how many of the programmes would be rolled out. Uh, it, it stresses high added value benefits, opportunities to secure investment into the valley area, significant rail investment, which uh, is obvious with this application today, but benefit in MPD and powers and complementing the transport of Wales with the rolling stock, trains and carriageways, innovation solutions and significant programme for station investment. I stress not a lot there locally, really. The report states there might be an opportunity with wider investment to a link to a Delight Valley energy cluster. Again, an opportunity. Again, welcome this, but no real commitment at this stage as outlined in the report. This section also states that there will be opportunities for retraining because of the nature of highly specialised jobs needed. 
are there is nobody in the whole of South Wales labour market qualified. I find that absolutely unbelievable. Uh, nobody in the whole of Wales not qualified. So how long would retraining take? Would local people be given the opportunity re to retrain in this industry? Or would these jobs be taken already by those working in the industry from across the UK? Planning obviously doesn't give us control over the market forces for jobs. So uh, it's important to have an understanding would any local jobs be presented in that way. The next section is on page 31, the future Wales that acts to provide guidance to private and public investment so that any investment is used for greater well-being and creation of better places. Chapter three indicates their outcomes led. Well, we can have this, can we have assurances and the confidence that the developer will meet a number of these objectives, whilst currently this is a failure at the moment in the whole of the Delice Valley, or most of the points, arguably, in that section, but particularly seven and eight, where transport is highlighted, it's very poor in the Delice Valley, and the digital infrastructure has already failed um, established businesses, our members, our members would be aware I raised this issue at many times, and, uh, and I would remember that I still raised it with Welsh Government, who have failed to respond to the needs where pockets of the Delice Valley are let down. Will this development bring a first-class digital infrastructure to the Delice Valley as part of the uh, initial programme? On page 46, pre-application consultation, you will see how the report that took place was hampered, obviously, by the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 situation. However, as you will see, many businesses, residents, AMs, MPs, community and county borough councillors, both M Lisa Patalba, Powers, community groups, leaders, and other interested parties from both Lisa Patalba and Powers got involved. And with various open days with ARA and presentations from the very beginning. I myself, as a local ward member and a representative of Nantelli Lays of Kibbethry, also had a number of meetings and presidents with other county and community councillors with the chief executive of uh, Celtic Energy. One of these meetings was actually attended by Mr Ball and the head of planning at the time, Nicola Pierce. I can only say that whilst it is recognised that at a number of places in the report to look further at potential community benefits, that was strongly put forward from each stage of the public consultation level with Arab. Uh, may I add that it's been mentioned regularly here that the, the consultation didn't produce many people put it into the system. Can I say that they come to the county borough councillors with these problems? Not everybody likes to write an email or send a letter in. So uh, uh, it was quite more extensive than is laid out in this report today. I'm disappointed that Welsh Government, and they are, I believe, partners in the project, the rail industry, didn't see the potential of what we could have delivered in this estimated £150 million project, where we've just heard from a representative Welsh Government, this could be a, a even more significant in, uh, income, sorry, uh, project money, as in over 200 million, uh, that a tourism and a commercial, commercial passenger transfer system up the Delice Valley was not recognised. Um, passenger platforms at Crane and Sem Sisters and Banwen were put forward at the beginning, but the proposal was only an idea. It was supported by Neat Patalba Council's previous chief executive and leaders of council, also by local members of the Delice Valley businesses across the Talbot Council and corresponding county councillors of Powys. Uh, so, others I could mention, and, and head of planning at the time suggested we could look at a feasibility study. However, while I recognise, Chair, and appreciate the reasons given in the report today on page 82, why this could not happen. Thank you. Could not, could not be legally entered into at this stage. Can this be explained why? As I don't agree with it, unfortunately. Further investigation as part of a regional transport solution would be the way forward. 
uh, as part of that feasibility study, I'm led to believe. But I, I just query that uh, why legally it couldn't be entered into. Now, there was an opportunity at this stage, lost in my opinion, and is respective at the report alluded to again on page 82, the uh, future Wales 2040 states continue development and, and expansion might be where a future passenger train service lie going forward. I believe I probably need to remain optimistic that our communi communities will see this development happen in the future. But it's going to be very unusual and frustrating for families and children if this application is passed to watch empty passenger trains going up and down the Delight Valley line in the future because of the reasons I've given today. It may form part of a tourism train spotting exercise in villages across the Delight Valley and not just up at the proposed site of the development as mentioned in the report. Councillor, um, if I if I, if I could just stop you there, um, I, I'm getting a message that, um, and I understand you have many questions, but uh, could we just take could take a break there? I'm sorry to stop you in midstream. Answer the questions so far, because otherwise I think we may lose some of your answers. Are you okay with that? I am. There was one line I didn't read out, and then it would go on to another section. So okay, then uh, read the let, last let, line. Let me just read that last line. How are we proposing to mitigate or possibly embrace such activity? Uh, when I mentioned there the, the tourism train right. spot. So that that was the last bit of that one before I move on. All uh, right. I've then. only got another two sections anyway, but uh, there we are. All right. I, I, yeah, I'll well, take your lead on that, Chair. OK, thank you. thank you. Thank you for that. I'm just um, ex hearing from officers that um, it might it might be easier to deal with them as you're going through. So we'll go back to the first lot of questions. Who's going to? Uh, uh, there was uh, page 36. Steve, will it be you or somebody else? Um. Yeah, I think it would probably be me to, to start with at the very Thank least. You. Um, Thank you. I mean, obviously, I mean, just just to emphasise for, for the committee benefit, I mean, I, I've engaged with um, Councillor Hunt and uh, Councillor Causey as, sure. as the most effective local representatives, and, yeah. and we, we've had these discussions, and and, I, and I'm more than happy with, with uh, Councillor Hunt in terms of putting forward his views on, on behalf of the community. And, and, you know, when you say that there's only been a few people, you know, it, it is a matter of fact, we've only had four objections and one support, but I don't doubt at all what you say and that the community talk to each other and they talk to their ward representatives and it's your role obviously to put forward the views of, of your community and, and I'm sure everyone on in the room slash screen would, would appreciate that. Um, in terms of the issues raised, I mean, you talk about uh, first thing you said about page 36 in terms of the internal consultees and, and I think obviously what you're intimating really is that I guess what you're saying is there's a lot of um, not not conjecture. It's, there's a lot of information there that says this will generate opportunities. And I guess what I think reading between the lines, what you're concerned about is it, it may happen, but where's the commitment to make it happen um, and to make those impacts, you know, the, for the the benefits actually derive as much as possible locally. Um, and I think it, it's a tr from a planning perspective, obviously what we're here today to do and what my report has done is to assess the impact of this development and part of which is to consider the, the need for it and the socioeconomic benefits and weigh those in the planning balance. Um, some of the, the clear issues will derive from this, you know, the provision of this facility and the research and development and the infrastructure testing and, and the rail industry side of things, this development that will it will happen. You know, if this happens, those benefits will derive immediately and directly from this development. The other benefits are less tangible today to say what can happen. But when you say, you know, there's no real commitment. I mean, I, I've been involved in this project from the start for the last few years in terms of discussions. It is a joint venture between Neath and, and Paris councils with the Welsh Government. It is going to become a, an industry-led um, proposal. Um, I have no doubt at all in my mind that um, while, while you can't say they're promises of everything that will be delivered, the um, expectation of everyone involved in this is that, that I, I said the field of dreams approach, I, I strongly believe that if this happens, the rest yeah. will flow over. I mean, you said decades. It could take that long, but you know, ultimately, this is significant economic development. This is, you know, a, an opportunity that has to be grasped with both hands. And in my eyes, 
those benefits will be wide ranging and inevitably they won't all be consumed and retained locally, but there will be clearly opportunities for clusters and benefits to arise from it. Um, so you, the next thing you talk about in terms of the confidence about delivering on objectives and you said about sustainable travel and digital infrastructure. Again, my strong feeling on that is this project can't give you those confidence that it would absolutely happen. But if it didn't happen, you've got no chance. But I think the sustainable travel, the creation of the rail link, the potential for passenger transport, the potential for tourism improvements, the feasibility stuff you talk about later, all those things, mm. this is so much more likely to happen as a consequence of the substantial investment and commitment from the Welsh Government and the Welsh Ministers and the industry in terms of the industry-led proposal as a consequence of granting planned mission. And that's where I think we have, it's, it's not a leap of faith because it's a leap of faith supported by the evidence that's before us an environmental statement about the commitments from all parts of the joint venture to create those opportunities um when you say about the, the benefits locally for example you know we we talked the other day um councillor hunt about that there's a condition on on our application that is recommended relating to local labor employment now the welsh government have it, there's a link in the, in my report that talks about how welsh government do it to try and deliver these local benefits but I felt and, and Nicola, our director, felt it was, a, it was appropriate to place a condition that that requires the, the applicant to actually seek to demonstrate the best, you know, to give the best opportunities for local labour and local recruitment. We can't guarantee anything, but what we can do is we can <clears throat> give the best opportunity for those benefits to, to derive locally for training and skills to be developed for the long term. And I think, you know, that condition and generally this application does that. You know, we can't give absolute cast iron guarantees, but I know for certain that all parts of, of the um, the jigs or so to speak are directed towards local and regional as well as national and decarbonisation objectives that this development has got so much play individually and cumulatively. And that's why there's such a wide ranging set of benefits. Um, finally, in terms of the question you raised, you, you said why, you know, in terms of we talked about feasibility and passenger transport and everything and why can't we do it at this stage you said why you know what are the reason behind it so when i when i say it can't be legally achieved what um i'm sure members will know but i'll reiterate is there are six legal tests and conditions that are set out within within um guidance effectively and for any condition it has to be necessary it has to be relevant to planning relevant to the development to be permitted enforceable precise and reasonable in all other respects there are six tests of condition they're legal tests that have to be complied with for any condition and um, what the report effectively says is requiring anything to be done to require you know a degree of passenger activity for platforms for feasibility work to be undertaken that would not pass all six of those legal tests there, there are you know the clear relation between this development and those aspirations are quite clear and what i've said to you personally and in the report is you know if if this rail center happens as we all expect and hope it will the opportunities are much more likely to flow and and the report says and you've talked about future wells future wells specifically talks about potential for the swansea Ammon, and dulles valleys to to consider introduction of rail transport and what I've said to you before and what I say now is if, if it comes down to a, a beauty contest between three lines in the future for feasibility, the fact that there's a, a global centre rail excellence at the top of one is probably more likely to, um, you know, throw the, the balance in, in, in its favour of the Dulles Valley being looked at first. Mm. I can't say for certain, but that's my personal view, not necessarily professional, but that's my personal view is, you know, the whole field of dreams again, said it three times, if you build it, that may come, who, who knows? So that would then derive additional local, clear local benefits as a consequence. And this has to be a long-term project. It's a long-term um, economic development solution for the for the Upper Dyes Valley. Um, and that's why we can't condition it, but we all have a strong desire that that will arise as a consequence of this development. I think, Councillor, that that's answered most of those yeah. initial points. Is there anything I'm else? I'm sure Councillor Hunt will come back if, if not. But Councillor Hunt, so far, have your questions been answered? Yeah, this is why I didn't want to break. I could have done it at the end, but that's fine, Chair. You are right. Uh, yeah, I, 
I can understand, I'm sorry to say, you, you said it don't meet the legal requirements or tests. Therefore, they're probably not going to meet the legal requirements or tests in the future. Nothing much is going to uh, change. And that's why I, I thought Mike Shaw may have come in on the legal responsibility. Listen, I, I'm, I, I'm going to ask him now, Councillor Hunt, don't worry. Yeah, Jay, I'm just saying that I understand what Steve is saying. Uh, but I, I think we could have uh, uh, had this uh, condition to meet the legal requirements. And that's my opinion. But I, I take leave of uh, the, the legal officer, uh, uh, Mr. Ball. I appreciate because I know that's what you're going to tell me, Chair. Thank you. No, that, that, that and, and you're doing your job to represent the wishes and concerns of your residents. And I totally get and understand that. But we are here today to deal with what is possible today, what is in front of us today. And I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Mike Shaw now, our legal um, officer, to clarify or even add to what to uh, Mr. Ball, if there is indeed anything to add. Mr. Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Councillor Hunt. Yes, well, th there is nothing that I have to add to Steve's analysis of the uh, the six um, criteria which need to be passed uh, in, in that respect. So Steve's analysis of the law as I see it uh, is an appropriate reading of that. OK, thank you very much for that, Mr Shaw. Uh, I'll come back briefly to Mr Ball, who's indicated, and then we'll go back to Councillor Hunt. And I do believe that Councillor Causey is now with us. So as soon as we finish with Councillor Hunt, I will go to uh, Councillor Causey. Thank, thank you, Chair. All, all I was just going to say, and, and Councillor Hunt said at the end, and it won't meet the test in the future. Um, what I would say is we're here to determine this application. Yes. If if an application comes before us in the future that has any bearing or relationship to these issues, we then have to consider again whether it meets the test. But generally speaking, potential for reopening up the passenger lines or doing something on there is is more than likely not a planning matter. It's more a Welsh government matter. It's it's an operational network rail matter about facilitating that. And I I have no doubt that. Um, those issues will be considered at, uh, you know, at Welsh government level as part of joint ventures at points in the future, because, you know, there's a clear direction in future Wales about that as a potential option. So I, I have little doubt, but um, it is not necessarily will it meet tests in the future unless it's a planning matter and more than likely it wouldn't come before us as a planning matter. Thank you. Thank you Sorry to have interrupted you, Councillor Hunt. You may proceed now. Yeah, Chair, and there was one part he did, Mr Ball didn't answer when I referred to the uh, tourism train spotting. Yeah, he, he, he didn't cover that uh, because uh, whether it forms part of this application, but it is mentioned in the report as uh, I've been on Cloyne. However, I have an iron bridge in SEM just for information and, and uh, I'm sure all members will know that a passenger train service does actually go up this particular track. Uh, already uh, okay. as a tourism train. So we get lots of people uh, in and around the rail lanes, up on the bridges, watching the passenger train traveling up this line. So uh, again, uh, you know, it's part of this application. We need to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, informed of, of what we might be doing in respect to such a s situation in the future. Uh, okay. so I, I'm happy to move on, but I don't know if you want to go back to Mr. Ball. He didn't... No, I don't think I don't think it's necessary. I, I think Mr. Ball has explained uh, the planning officer's perspective. I think we'll make a bit of progress now, Councillor Hunt. OK, thank you, Chair. Right. My, my next question is um, why isn't there a 106 agreement forming part of the application today? We know what a 106 is. Agreements are a legal agreement between local authorities and developers that are linked to planning permission and can also be known as planning obligations. Why I refer to them is that um, if the platforms were not achievable at this stage, why haven't we still got some kind of one or six agreement in place to support the Delays Valley? I understand they, they no longer form part of a community benefit, but they do have formed some part of the planning obligation, as I mentioned already, in helping the communities here in the Delight Valley. Active travel is an important part of Neathport Talbot Council, which isn't delivering a lot to our valley communities currently. Couldn't a safe cycle route or walking route form part 
of this application to link Banwyn or Incloint and to Sam Sisters. The current routes for cyclists are very dangerous indeed, and many cyclists choose not to use the link road unless they are experienced riders. My next question is more broader, and it's to do with the noise nuisance, noise impact, um, uh, and the vibration report that's been covered uh, starting on page 66. I fully appreciate what the report is saying and what as conditions and expert analysis has laid out for this in the report. Um, have we got any similar operating facilities uh, to know that all noise levels are acceptable? As I mentioned earlier uh, in, in the address, this facility, if passed, will be with us or all living closer to the for decades to come. So we cannot have an acceptable vibration or noise at the site. I appreciate many of the residents live in the, in the closest and some already form part of the planning application with their letters. But what assurance is we able, able to give those living in close proximity that their lives will not be affected by unnecessary noise and vibration? And would they not be affected if needed to sell their properties as, as in an adverse way in the future? And then can I ask Justin Griffiths Highways um, that no sorry, that no materials as to the construction of this development will be brought through the Delays Valley as Crane and Stem Incline, but use of rail on the A465 will be completely the way to transport to the site. Our small communities cannot sustain large, heavy transport, transport vehicles. Finally, Chair, my last question, and I do apologise, I have taken so long in my address, but I explained at the beginning, this application needs to be thoroughly scrutinised. Uh, lots of questions, statements need to be given. I did have many more, but I believe the ones I've raised in a broader sense are an accumulation of those that the residents have given me. So as I said, my last question today, you'll be glad to know, and it's in relationship to the short statement on page 81. Again, Steve alluded to it. It mentioned the rights of ways officer and no objection to the application and a separate consultation possible planning application would need to be considered in the future. Could we have John, as we have John here today, could we have him to explain in more detail as to any ramifications this application might have as to rights of ways becoming a problem or uh, um, at any scales for this potential com committee. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if if uh, this is a long drawn out uh, process, would it would it affect what we deliver here today? Um, as I said, Chair, apologies for the lengthy statement this morning, uh, but I believe it was needed to be said and addressed so that the residents' views through me uh, have, have been. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, and as you said okay. earlier, it's, I, I'm just trying to do my job. Uh, Absolutely, I understand that. that. Uh, Thank, thank you. Yeah, and I totally agree with you that this is a serious application and questions have to be asked and answered. And I am doing my best here today. So we'll go back to uh, the the. We've done the six legal tests. Afterwards, uh, similar operation facilities elsewhere, Mr. Ball. This is a brand new. Yeah, uh, I mean, facility, there was, there was so we, yeah. yeah there, there was there was one other point before that, Chair, um, that Councillor Hunt said, "Why no Section 106 agreement?" Oh, the 106. Um, yes. The, the the easiest response to that is the six legal tests that I explained about conditions also apply to legal obligations. They are statutory legal tests for planned obligations as well as for conditions. Um, Section 106 agreements in their strictest form uh, are only there to control matters that A, can't be controlled by condition and B, that are required to, you know, statutory required to mitigate identified impacts of development to make it acceptable. In other words, you can't put a, a Section 106 on there just because you want one. You have to have identified that it is the requirements of 106 is required to mitigate the identified impacts of the development. Um, in this case, um, that you know the matters again related to Dallas Valley and everything, it wouldn't it it wouldn't meet the the test as a consequence. Um, you you talk about active travel and everything, you know that those kind of things can potentially deal with it, but there are 
you know the report deals with sustainable transport and active travel there are improvements in terms of the uh, provision of cycle shared cycleway footways and improvements to the to the bus infrastructure on the, the junction to encourage their use etc it doesn't provide um additional uh, active travel routes beyond the site in that regard but that there aren't any identified routes within the active travel plan in this area that would would need or would justify the improvements as a consequence of this development um it's it's not something that's been raised by yourself as ward member or, or others in terms of specifically what would have been required um what i would say it's probably worth having those discussions with uh with the the, the gcre company in the future just to see whether there's any any um relationship that you know contributions or something might be done but not directly considered as part of this development to be required under section 106. Okay. um noise wise um I think it's probably worth me bringing Simon Evans in because you know you've heard a lot from me um they're, they're, you're right there aren't any similar facilities in the UK that you can do it but the environmental statement has considered you know a, a range of different things in terms of different assessments and come up with that matters you want assurances that lives won't be affected I think Simon will probably be the best one to explain to you why yep. we our environmental health officers have the confidence in the conditions um based on the environmental state uh, statement predictions so perhaps we go to Simon first and then after that, there was a question for Justin and then a question for John. So perhaps um, we'll go in that order if, if that's OK, Chair. Thank you. Doing my job for me, Mr. Paul. No Sorry, problem. <laughs> it's OK. Um, right. So uh, we'll go to Simon first for the environmental aspects of it. And then Justin is indicating I think he's chomping at the bit to say something. So we'll come to you later. And just uh, because it's only something I've been speaking to, uh, Councillor Cause, you're still here, yes? So I'm going to come to you after Councillor Hunt. Thank you. Simon. You're on mute at the moment. I accidentally muted myself just before speaking. Don't Sorry, worry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, on the issue of um, similar facilities, obviously, I think uh, one of the issues with this is that it is very much a new type of um, facility. So what we've done is that we've used um, a uh, technique or rather the applicant um, carried out noise assessments in accordance with a technique that's used for uh, rail developments across the whole of the uh, UK. So it probably it would have been used for the likes of you know HS2 and and cross rail and things like that so it's the standard you know noise assessment techniques for rail projects um, now what we have done with that is that uh, in the negotiations with the developer and obviously looking at what's in the environmental statement we have uh, looked at what they've said uh, we have set noise limits, which are obviously con um, contained in the conditions, and we've kind of written multi-stage conditions. So we've set noise limits, which are uh, at a level which we are satisfied will protect the immunity of uh, the area. Um, they are, they're, let's say they're reasonably challenging targets, but obviously based on the environmental statement that they're saying that they can achieve them. What with by having these multi-stage conditions, we have limits. Then we're requiring them to test to prove that they're reaching those limits. We're requiring them to have operational plans to show how they're going to run the centre to carry it out. And we've also built in the factor of review as well into the operational plans to say, right, you've done testing, it's not working. You now have to come forward and tell us exactly how you're going to fix it, fix the problem. So we're trying to build it in as a feedback loop to keep on bringing it around that if problems do occur, well, I'm hopeful that if they build it to the design standard it shouldn't, but if they do occur, there's a mechanism within the planning um, uh, uh, permission, if, if granted, to bring them back to the table to come up with a solution. With regards to gen noise impacts in general, um, we obviously acknowledge that particularly at night, at night um, when the road traffic noise from the uh, Intervalley Road um, particularly drops away, um, noise limits do get quite quiet. And obviously concerns have been expressed by residents regarding 24 hour operation. However, noise um, has been uh, assessed against the World Health Organization criteria for sleep disturbance and um, which forms part of one of the relevant British standards for uh, noise assessments. And they've been able to demonstrate that the noise levels will comfortably achieve those even in some of the very quiet places 
uh, in the area. So you know that's one of our one of, that was one of our key concerns in this. Um, you've mentioned vibration. Um, the one thing with vibration is that it does fade away very quickly over distance, mm -hmm. and so running of the uh, of the trains on the track, even the infrastructure test track, which will have a heavy load on it, should not be significant for um, residents. Thank you, Mr Evans, for your input there. Uh, Councillor Hunt, are you happy with the explanations given to you for your questions? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Chair from Simon. Uh, I, I wait for John and Justin. Uh, Justin, uh, yeah, um, just, yeah, I'm going to come to Justin now, who, uh, Mr Griffiths, our highways and drainage expert, um, you indicated you wish to say something as well. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hunt, for your comments relating to uh, transport and deliveries, etc. It is definitely something that uh, we were uh, sort of keen on with regards to deliveries to and from this site. And we, we mentioned, and Ismail also mentioned in the report, I hasten to add, page 37, whereby we raised the concern about any uh, if uh, there, are, uh, there are any abnormal loads or mm. HGVs that they do not uh, travel through Seven Sisters to access the site. That would be predominantly through the Inter Valley Road, as said within the report, and that will be for deliveries and for construction traffic as well. The access of, um, of Wembley Road or Wembley Street, uh, it will be uh, predominantly for um, staff, and also for emergency vehicles as well as the other route as well for emergency vehicles. So there'll be a combination for both of those. But uh, as it clearly states there, it is something that uh, I, had, I had certainly made reference to in, in, with regards to the consultation process with the applicant uh, and obviously their consultants as well, which is something that we will incorporate as part of this approval as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Griffiths, and I'm I'm grateful. I, I don't know if it was Steve who put the uh, condition up there. Yeah, that was me. Y yeah, lovely. So <laughs> it, it is, it, yes, it, it's great to have that on the screen. Um, I should point out for... Yes. Um, sorry? Yes, Councillor Hunt? No, I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you for that, Justin, and I did see it in the report, but I, I think I, uh, I was asked to raise it once more. Uh, at this meeting, that's all. I, I, I was aware of it. I have given that assurances to the community. However, I was still asked to raise it. I just want yes. to clarify that why why I raised it. <laughs> no you. problem at all, Councillor Hunt. We we are all subject to these things from time to time. I understand. OK, so I just wanted to explain to uh, members who are uh, visitors to the committee that although we do have the screen and officers share the screen, members of the committee have uh, IT equipment in which they can really zoom in. So it's not just the vision that you see on the screen. Members of the committee have much more in-depth um, uh, access to diagrams and, and and such. So I just wanted to make that point clear to anybody who hasn't got that um, equipment with them today. OK, well, thank you very much, Councillor Hunt, uh, for your questions. And I'm going to go now to uh, Councillor Causey, who did. Your chair, John, John, John Griffiths. John no, yeah. right. OK, sorry, beg your pardon, Mr Griffiths. Thank you, Chair, and hello, hello, Councillor Hunt. Um, yeah, with regard to the rights of way um, element, it is a separate legal process. Mm -hmm. So the um, the applicant will be making, if the this planning application is successful, um, make an application to um, regularise the rights of way which are affected by the development. So we will then carry out after we get the application a, um, an extensive consultation with the statutory consultees, which are. Ramblers Association, British Horse Society, um, local members, um, town and community councils. Right. And we will gauge the um, feedback of any application that we have. So what we often find is that there's a lot of to and fro in between us and the applicant to see what we can do to um, rejig or uh, refine any, any application we get. And then when we're happy that um, we've done as much as we can do, and all parties hopefully are on board. We will then take that to um, committee 
and as part of a legal order process, another consultation will take place again with the statutory consultees, but also with the wider public. So it'll go in the press, um, we write to various people and also it'll go on site. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to know the outcomes of this until the process is started and, and, and completed. I would imagine that it's a public inquiry. I would imagine that we will get objections. I think every order that I have have ever made as a rights away order, I, well, so 99% get objections. So those objections will be passed on to the planning inspectorate, and I would imagine that the matter will be dealt through I, through either a public inquiry or through written representations. So it is a long drawn out process. Um, it's difficult to put an estimate on the timescales, but before COVID, we were saying that an application without objections would take about nine months, with objections could take 18. But with COVID, and we know the difficulties associated with, with various things, that time frame might be a little bit under what, what it could be. Um, with regards to um, the actual development of the site, um, obviously until those paths are, are realigned or um, dealt with by the planning process, um, they need to be protected so the development can't affect those those parts. So th 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 there there will be um, some delay in, in in until the process is is is, is resolved. So there are ramifications. I mean, hopefully, um, the uh, the the application will 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 not modify the rights away network significantly. Mm -hmm. But until we start the process and we run through the consultation exercise, it's difficult to know the outcomes, and that's why it's not part of the. Of, 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 the, of the planning process. Thank okay. you, Mr Griffiths. That was uh, very welcome. Uh, I'm, I can see Councillor Hunt nodding and other members nodding. Just, it is often, yeah, it is, I... Uh, just, just one moment, it, it is often the case in planning that we have to deal with things sequentially. Um, we, we are here today to look at this application. However, there are processes that will be going on in the background at the same time concurrently. So. I do, I do get that, and I hope uh, that that is coming across. Councillor Hunt, did you want to inter interject? Yeah, just last point from me before you go to Dean Chair, because uh, I appreciate the time you've given me. It is uh, very much appreciated, as I said. Um, okay. uh, I've made the, the the points raised by residents and, and other groups of here in the Delice Valley to me, uh, uh, and I've made the, some of the negative uh, uh, points that this application may be perceived to bring. However, yes. uh, as a planning committee member, the positives in this application today outweigh those negativities. I'm only doing my job, I stress it, probably said it about 20 times, uh, sure. and I will be supporting this application here today. But I, but I, I, I needed to stress that there, there are, as I've uh, indicated, some negativities to the proposal as seen by the local communities in the Delice Valley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. And um, I, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, and I'm very grateful that you did add at the end that you're in total uh, agreement with, with the project. So then, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to Councillor Causey now. Um, Councillor Causey, I know you had difficulties earlier, but we rearranged the speakers and we'll come back to you now. Th thank you very much, Chair. And apologies, they dropped out. It's not I'm a very good reception, Councillor Causey. In my he hasn't got it on. Great. So Councillor Causey, uh, if I may stop you, uh, we're not hearing you very well at all. I'm not sure if there's anything to do. Do you me a turn? No. Sorry. Slightly better. Yeah, yeah, that is slightly better. Yes. No. Yes, that is slightly better. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, we can hear you. We can hear you, Councillor Causey. OK, we seem to have lost Councillor Causey temporarily. This is one of the pitfalls of this type of meeting. I'll, I'll progress the meeting and if and when Councillor Causey. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you, Councillor Causey. I leave my camera. 
Um, yeah, turn your camera off. Okay, thanks for speaking today. I'm, I'm afraid this is one of the um, problems in, in that if we get somebody who's remote and the the connection breaks down and uh, you know I totally get where you're coming from Councillor Hunt this is just uh, one application of what happens yeah so I, I do get what you're saying I'll progress the meeting again uh, uh, along to the committee members and I'll come back to Councillor Causey as and when we get a better connection okay I'm not going to forget about Councillor Causey therefore then um, it's been long so far we, we're nearly up to two hours already uh, but do, do I have any questions or comments statements from members of the planning committee please if you could indicate with raising your hand just a second. Uh, Councillor Arwen Wilcox, please. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I, I, I promise I, I won't be long <coughs> because, <coughs> excuse me, part of the of the of, of one of the questions I was going to uh, ask has already been addressed. But if I could expand just a bit on that. But before I get into that, can, can I just say that the fact that this investment is coming to Wales is an honour. <laughs> The fact that is coming that that confidence is being shown in Neath for Talbot and Powys to deliver this project is a huge and massive bonus, in my opinion. Um, the diversion order that uh, Mr. Griffiths uh, just uh, went through, uh, and yes, I agree that 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 was one of my concerns about the length of time that this can take, um, because the the paragraph at the top of page. 39 does state that it, it is an offence to develop over the line of a public right of way and therefore this process has to has to be gone through properly before development can take place uh, across those rights of way now and for some reason i've lost my note no i got them back um right um the, the, the follow-on question to that then to what mr griffiths has already given an answer Mm -hmm. Are there any affected foot footpaths that currently cross the local boundaries between uh, Neath Potolbot and Powys? That that's the one question, Chair. And very quickly, then uh, the second question. Uh, I note uh, Mr. Ball's comments right at the start of his address uh, with regard to the existing minerals freight line, uh, which cannot be considered as part of this application. However, I note that within the report, it does state that some deliveries to the proposed site will be by road. And, and, and I come back to what Mr. Griffiths has said as well uh, about the exclusions that have been put in place. But could, could I make just a comment here to our Welsh Government observers present today? Of course. That preserving the existing line would be an advantage not only for the delivery of, um, or, or, or sorry, not, not only for passenger transport, perhaps at some time in the future, but for the delivery of such heavy goods uh, vehicles. So th that, that's an observation that, that, that perhaps our colleagues from Welsh Government can take, can take away with them. But if Mr Griffiths could outline whether there are any footpaths, please, that cross the boundaries of Neath Talbot and Powys. Thank, Thank you for your question, Councillor Wilcock. Uh, Mr Griffiths, if you have got an answer for Councillor Wilcock, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, it's very strange, but we've got a bridleway which we have registered in Neath Patara, and so have Powys have got registered in Powys, and it's the same bridleway, which is bizarre. I've not seen that before. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, okay. So, yeah, which is peculiar. We, we've both got it. Um, Yes, and, and then we've got a path in the sort of the western side, which which sort of goes into Powys. So, I mean, there, there is obviously a connectivity there. The washery site, on, which is the eastern part of the application, I mean, that's just contained within our area, so it doesn't really impact on Powys. But there is some joined up um, approach that we as some Powys will have, and the applicant will obviously be aware of that when they make the application put to both authorities. OK, um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Council... Who's that? Sorry. It's, it, sorry, it's, it's me, Chair. I, I, I've shared oh. shared the Im I've shared shared the image in terms of the that comes from the environmental statement that shows the the affected footpath, etc. Um, I think the most important message really is, as I say, there's been engagement with um, Sean Barnes, who's on the call from Paris, and and with John. Yes. 
and generally involves it for issues to be common land and, and public rights away. There are strategies that are being being developed and will be put in place related to it. I think that the biggest issue in terms of the footpath networks are the fact that lots of them do crisscross the existing mineral site as well. So it is something that that is very aware. All parties are aware of the need to address these issues to make sure that there's no unacceptable impacts arising as a consequence of of the development. So, you know, I, I'm relatively comfortable in, in that regard, although that there may be, you know, time involved in addressing it. But generally speaking, you know, the impacts are actually relatively um, minimal. I mean, if you look, I did this this plan here, this this shows the footpaths as they go go through the red line boundary, etc. And and you know I, I've walked along here myself, and it, it's it's outside of any area of, of particular um, new development. These these plans here, this one here comes comes across uh, where uh, the lines might come across, and with the access. But these matters, I'm, I'm sure, can be addressed through you know design and regulatory processes. It's it's just it, there may be a bit of time involved, but the the strategies in place to, to try and address it. And John and Sean and and the develop uh, Welsh ministers and the GZRE company when it's developed will be looking. So to make sure all these matters are addressed as part of the time scale to so it doesn't impact on the delivery of the project. Uh, absolutely, Mr. Ball. And, and uh, the walkers who use these footways and bridleways, um, that they will be very interested indeed that they don't um that, that they continue to be used if and when they can. So I would uh, go back to Councillor Wilcock. Councillor, are you um are you happy with the response that you've had? And I would suggest that you continue to have dialogue with uh, officers. And I don't know if Sean is willing or able to say anything in response to those questions. Councillor Wilcock first, are you are you happy so far? And I, yeah, yes, for, 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 for more than happy, Chair. The, 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 I think that addresses uh, as, as some of the okay. concerns that I had. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm not sure whether Sham was come has come ready for any questions. I think it was just in an observing role that she wanted to come and see the meeting. So I'm not going to call on her. But all members know that though these uh, experts are on hand and they will be dealing with it, but it's not part of this application. So uh, that's been clearly put by uh, Mr. Ball. But it, that's not to say that uh, both councils aren't going to be working very hard to make sure that those existing bridleways and um, footpaths continue to be of use if it's safe to do so. OK. Uh, anybody else uh, from the planning committee now wishing to ask a question? I'm just. No. OK, I can't see anybody at the moment. I'm just going to give people a little bit of time. Let's see if Councillor Causey is able to come back in. Oh, Councillor Rosalind Davis first, and then we'll, we'll see about Councillor Causey. Well, it's an observation, uh, really. I of think course. This, this is an excellent project. And um, I personally am looking forward to it myself because it, it, it'll put Wales on the map, actually, not only the Delis Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think it's excellent. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I've um, been working with local universities and I think they need to come aboard very much more than they have by the looks of it, especially Swansea. They've got an excellent engineering department there and they and they should benefit from this as well. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I understand from democratic service officers that we are continuing to experience in difficulties in trying to get Councillor Causey in the meeting to the extent that he can be understood. I think that we can get the breakup we can't hear what he's saying. No, I can see it's not going to happen today. So, um, Mr. Ball, you have spoken with Councillor Corsi regarding his concerns. Now, I don't want you to put anything, so to speak. Oh, Councillor Paul, yes, we have a message from Councillor Corsi. Sincere apologies. <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad. I mean, I was just just going to probably say exactly what Councillor Causey has just said. I mean, uh, myself and Steve Hunt um, and and Councillor Causey had a chat last Thursday, and I think Councillor Hunt has has uh, 
you know, put forward the views from the community, yes. both both in support and in terms of the issues of, that to address and concerns. But as Councillor Causey said in the text there, he, he has explained to me and in that text that he fully supports this. He has called it a once in a generation potentially transformational project. Yeah. And I think that that is probably all you need to know. He, he, he When we spoke, he didn't raise the issues of, of concern. Um, he, he was satisfied when when we spoke that that the need to address amenity had been fully assessed and that he you know I explained my confidence in the assessment we've done and the conditions we placed to protect that amenity and and and, and even to the extent that the, the the benefits arising from this would probably potentially have outweighed minor impacts but we are satisfied with those degree of impacts anyway so I, I'm grateful for Councillor Cause for putting that in writing and yes. and that he's fully supportive of the project. Thank you, yes, uh, as am I. Um, Councillor Bamsey is indicating, but I'd just like to say that uh, it's very um, unfortunate that we couldn't hear from Councillor Corsi direct. But I do know, uh, and you know, Councillor Hunt knows, that these meetings have been going on. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, his, his brief comment of a once in a generation uh, opportunity would be what he would he would have liked to have said here today now I'm, I'm not putting words in his mouth either but we do know that it's not just this first time that councillor Corsi would have mentioned anything uh councillor bamsey did you indicate please yes thank you chair okay. um just like to make a see my brief uh, point i fully support this project it's very exciting okay. it's excellent for the delays valley and mm -hmm. you know the both uh, counties um, only point I'd like to make, I just hope this is a catalyst now for um, improvements through transport across the whole of Wales. I think, you know, particularly rail has been, uh, you know, severely underfunded and underdeveloped for decades in Wales. So I just hope this will be a springboard for, for future improvements across uh, the rail sector, really, uh, mm -hmm. for years to come. Thank you, Councillor Bamsey. Yes, this, this is... Uh, uh, a very big opportunity for Wales and the UK as well. You know, th this doesn't exist within the UK at the moment. And uh, I can't remember which councillor said it, but the fact that it is coming to our Delice Valley, that our uh, council has been instrumental in, in working towards getting this application here today, um, can just strengthen our resolve as a council to do everything we can to regenerate the uh, valleys that were once reliant on coal. Um, if, if an opportunity comes along, and I don't think that this is just out of thin air, I think officers have gone looking, Welsh Government officers have gone looking, they've lobbied, they've tried to get funding, and here we are today with the application uh, before us. I can see that Councillor Hunt, is it another question, Councillor Hunt? So I've given you quite considerable time already. I appreciate that, Chair, and, I, uh, and I, I, I understand you thought it might be another question. No, I was just going to say, I think it would be appropriate when you come to the recommendation that I move that as a local member today, uh, as a member of this committee. Thank you. OK, I'm having lots of help with my job today. Thank you all. <laughs> OK, nobody else wishes to make a speech or comment questions. I can see no indications, uh, Tammy. No, as and I think uh, it's worth mentioning now that th this has been going on for over two hours now. I gave unlimited time to Welsh government and the agents to give their perspective. Local members have had their say. Um, I'm very sorry about Councillor Causey, but we can't do anything about that at this stage. Members of the committee have uh, had opportunities to say, I, as the chair, um, think this is such an exciting project. Uh, we have to start somewhere. There are unknowns, so to speak, but I think uh, councillor, um, sorry, officer, uh, Mr. Ball, comment about field of dreams is particularly apt. If we build it, then things may happen. But if we don't build it, then it's quite certain that they won't. So we have the opportunity here before us today, and I'm going to take us to the recommendations on the page 111, which is to recommend approval 
uh, with the, the whole raft of conditions, 60 plus conditions as attached to this report. Um, I will go to Councillor Steve Hunt to ask him to propose that. Chairman, uh, Chair, I will propose the recommendation laid out before us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask for a seconder from within the committee. Yes, happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilcock. Now I'm going to go to uh, Tammy Davis, the uh, Democratic Service Officer, again, to go through the regime that we do do in planning, to ask each member in turn if they have been present throughout the whole of the debate and which way they intend to vote. Um, I am Suzanne Patterson, the Chair, and I do intend to vote for the recommendation. So, Tammy, can you ask members of the voting uh, committee. Certainly, Chair, thank you. Uh, I'll start with yourself, Vice Chair, Councillor Sean Percy. Councillor Percy, have you been present for the whole of this meeting and how do you wish to vote? Yeah, I can confirm I've been present for the whole meeting and I'll be voting for the recommendation, Tammy. Thank okay. you. Same questions to the rest of the committee. Councillor Dennis Keogh, please. Thank you. I have been present for the entire meeting and I wholeheartedly support Thank you. Councillor Ridian Maison. He has left, Tommy, I think. Oh, yes. He, he, Councillor he left, Maison he said he had to leave. Of course, you have apologies, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Scott Bamsey. Thank you, Tommy. I did experience a few uh, difficulties for about three or four minutes um, with my ID, but I fully understand the uh, application. I've read the paper, so happy to vote in favour if that's okay. Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor Bamsey. That's quite acceptable, yes. Thank okay. you, Councillor okay. Ros Davis. I have been present for the whole meeting and I'm voting in favour, obliged. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Steve Hunt, please. I have been here for the whole presentation and I support the application. Thank you. Councillor Arwin Wilcock, please. Yes, Chair, I can confirm that I've been present for the entire meeting and I'm voting for the recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Suzanne Menkes, please. I confirm I've been here for the whole item and I vote for the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. There we go, Chair. That recommendation has been approved. Thank you, councillors. Um, I'm sure that, um, oh, yeah, well, we have a comment now from the cabinet member. Thanks to everybody. I um, beg your pardon, I've lost it now. Can somebody get that back up? It just flashed up and I, I've lost it again now. Yes, please, read, read out the um, cabinet member's comment, please. OK, councillor Annette Wingrave, LDP member, says huge thanks to everyone involved in presenting this report, especially Mr Ball, who has eaten and slept with this for months. Also, thanks to the chair and planning members, this application has the potential to place NPT and powers on the international map, and I thank you all. That's very welcome, uh, Councillor Wingrave. I'm sure all of the planning members concur with those sentiments. Um, we have our representations from Welsh Government and the agents who've heard all comments made today. I'm sure you will be um, taking those back with you to wherever um, they, they need to be voiced. Um, once again, my big thanks to uh, Mr Ball and his team, but also to every single officer of Neath Bot Albert who has made this happen today. This is very exciting and I'm sure we'll be back again um, once Powys have, have uh, done their application. D looking forward to all the exciting projects that may come this way. Thank you everybody for attending and your contributions today. I'll close the meeting.